So today is uh, 10 September, but we're reviewing how to set up Windows Server 2019 Standard Edition using uh, the education software license provided through the My Campus portal at UVI. Uh, you access this off of the My Campus option called Microsoft Software Download. When you click into here, there's a blue option to log in. You should use the blue option to log in, provide your email address that will take you to the My Campus login where you enter your student ID number. And then that opens up this screen here. You'll be started It'll, it'll show you the getting started screen or the overview and you want to select software. And then uh, the Windows Server 2019 Standard Edition, you want to download that, make sure you have a copy of the product key handy. One important aspect of your download, before you install your virtual machine locally using uh, local security account management, so this is this is designed to be done on your own machine. You want to make sure there's adequate hard drive space. You've gone through um, optimization of your personal technology and you have at least uh, 44 gigabytes of disk space free. Another thing you want to check is that once the download has been, uh, once the download has been made, you want to do a quick checksum. Uh, you want to check the sum of bytes for the download, which should precisely equal. You don't want to look at the size on disk because people's answers will vary with the size on disk, depending on the size of the disk sectors you use to format the C drive or the manufacturer formatted your C drive. Rather, you want to use the size in bytes um, on the disk and what it should read if, if, this, if the September 2019 update for this installation media is correct, it should read 5,292,310,528 bytes. Once your download is complete, you want to right click and go to properties and that's, that's how the screen comes up here. So once again, and just go to properties and this number has to match. If this number does not match, your download has been corrupted in some form or fashion. And with the next update that comes out for 2020, that, that checksum number will, will differ. Uh, any questions about, uh, are there any questions about getting a secure and complete copy of the installation media? No, got it. Okay. So I want to make sure that I know this is in uh, downloads. Another thing you want to do locally is create a temporary folder on your C drive if you haven't done this yet. So all you have to do is right click the white space with the right mouse button, create new folder. And inside that folder, you want to have two separate folders, one for the virtual hard disks that will be created uh, when your virtual machine is installed and configured. The other one is going to be a VM folder that we're going to point uh, virtual box to use to set up as a preference to set up here. It is extremely important that you uh, complete this step and configure preferences in virtual box. If your OneDrive is active, if it's open all the time and your documents happen to be stored with OneDrive, what will happen as you try to create the virtual machine is nothing short of Armageddon. Uh, you're gonna try to push 40 gigabytes of disk creation all the way across the internet connection that you have. It's very slow, very painful, it'll take forever. Whenever you try to run the VM, it'll be loading from the cloud, 40 gigabytes loading from the cloud, that just takes forever, it's not a good scenario. Here's what I'm talking about. Inside Oracle, 
VM VirtualBox Manager, when you double click VirtualBox, um, under files, the file menu, you have a preferences option and you can point to the default machine folder to the, the, the temp VM directory on your C drive. And this is how it should look. And uh, for display, you can also uh, basically take this out of automatic and define a specific uh, resolution and that's often helpful. I have a 14, I have a 1600 by 900 screen resolution. I can make sure that all of that resolution is used when I start a virtual machine. That's a nice option to configure. Another option to configure on the network, uh, when, when a network and NICs are added, you can basically set defaults to make sure that it's the bridged mode you want to go into, but we'll, we'll use another option to configure that in a moment. So if we're going to create our new Microsoft Server 2019 uh, machine, the first thing we need to do is to create a new machine. And you'll see that the machine folder preference is listed here. The type of operating system we're doing is correct, but the version of Windows that it's going to choose by by name, uh, by type, is, is not correct. We're going to change this so that it reads server 2019 64-bit. And we're going to give this, um, we'll call this uh, local SAM because we're creating a virtual system and we're using, we're, we're configuring an operating system to use local security account ma management on the local machine. And, but you could name it anything. I'm just going to, I'm going to do this um, just to keep that clear. As a minimum, you want to dedicate four megabytes of memory. The default is too small for the install. If you have extra memory, it's good to include more memory if you have it. Um, I'm going to put in, uh, let's see here. I'm going to put in six gigabytes. I'm going to use half of my laptop uh, potential. So 1024 times six is 6144. That's what I'm going to put in here. 6144. I'm going to create a virtual hard disk now and I will, I'll accept the VDI default uh, format for the, for the virtual hard disk type. That's what VirtualBox uses. I could use VHD if I want to be able to open this with Hyper-V in a Microsoft virtual machine management context, but I don't want to do that. Um, VMDK is the format used commonly by VMware. And uh, if you're going to be working or using virtual machines between VMware, you're going to choose this format. Or if you're going to be working with Hyper-V, you're going to use this format. In our case, we're just going to use VirtualBox. We're going to go ahead and click Next. The storage for your physical hard disk, if you were doing uh, prototyping, if you were testing beta software, if you were uh, benchmarking new methods or for operating systems design, you might want your hard disk to dynamically expand, but we're going to fix the size to 44 gigabytes at a minimum. Uh, if you have plenty of room, I would give it 56 or even 64 gigabytes if you have plenty to spare on your laptop. You're going to hit create. And there's only a couple of other changes that need to be made before we can start the virtual machine as if we're pushing the power button and then uh, begin our installation. So it's, it's going to take about two minutes 
to create the fixed VHD, the virtual hard disk, using VDI format. And uh, that's, that's a small trade-off for the amount of performance and wait time. If you use dynamic uh, types, basically, as you're using the virtual machine, there will be lots of pauses and delays and screen responsiveness throughout the use of the virtual machine. Generally speaking, if you're working in production environments, you always want to use a fixed hard disk size. When you're working um, special projects, prototyping, you're testing things, dynamic is good because sometimes you're taking a lot of snapshots and you want the disk to expand as needed. But you need lots of disk space to do that, and many of us are dealing with some tight quarters in that, in that regard. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pause the recording briefly just so this can run its course, and that's not going to be a part of the recording if, if you're playing it back. So... Uh, one thing we mentioned is that as the fixed hard disk is being, the virtual hard disk is being created, the amount of available hard disk space on your host system will shrink by that same amount. So 44 gigabytes have disappeared on my C drive. Uh, in the domain environment online, the host you'll use, we will designate a specific hard disk letter and directory to install your VHD in because we want to make sure that when you create your uh, your host your, your guest your guest operating system online in the domain environment that um, you're a good neighbor with other people who are are working in that in that same area. We'll be using Hyper-V instead of VirtualBox and the interface. Uh, Layout is different, but there are a lot of similarities and the process is very similar as well. As you create the virtual machine, it's gonna go ahead and prompt for the same kinds of information. So now you see that my local SAM machine, and that's just the name of the virtual machine file. Um, that's just the name of the the machine as it runs inside VirtualBox. Once the machine is running, I can give it a name that it possesses while it's active online with other, with other systems. So I'm not consigned to this name in particular. I am going to make some changes to the settings on this before, before I, um, before I go ahead and click the start button. For the same reason that I added additional RAM to speed the install process, on the system option, I'm going to uncheck the floppy disk. I don't have a floppy disk I'm going to use. This is something you should do also. We don't want it to search for a floppy disk. It isn't one. Uh, and then search for the DVD drive and then for the hard disk every time it starts up. We don't have a floppy disk in the host machine. You don't, you can't use what you don't have going to slow it down. The other thing that we're going to do on the processor side is we're going to increase the number of CPUs. You see that my host machine, uh, my host machine, the actual physical hardware on my laptop includes four cores. So the limitation on my virtual box options here is four CPUs. I'm going to take half of what's available. I want this running um, two CPUs. I can check this and check this if the VT uh, virtual options in BIOS are turned on. And you'll see in a minute that if this is incompatible, uh, we'll get a, a warning sign or an exclamation point. It's generally a good idea to turn these on if you can. For storage, You'll notice that your DVD disc is empty. We want it to boot to the install media. So this is an important step here. Uh, but let's back up. Are there any questions about changing the number of default processors to speed up the installation and operation of your virtual machine in initial stages? 
No question. So the the local sum appeared after the the um the setup of the initial server, correct? So that that's the machine that would show up. Correct. So left. Okay. So we walked through the process, gave it a name local underscore local sam. sam. Okay, yeah. And then yeah. from there you go into the settings. Okay, yeah, got it. So this is this is literally like uh choosing your own hardware. You go to the Dell website and you're picking how many CPUs, how much RAM you want, all that kind of stuff. Um, it's a good question. Thank you for asking. So, so we're going into the settings here. We've, we've increased. I'm also going to change NAT to bridged. I want the network card of my virtual machine to function just as a separate network interface on my network. That's an important change. If you have problems with that, you can change it back to NAT, but in most cases we want that to be a bridged adapter and that way you get a static, you get a you get a, your own IP address assigned. If you use NAT, it means your virtual machine is setting up uh, your PC to function like a wireless access, a wireless uh, router. And that means that you have, if you have a wireless router at your house, you're also doing that there. You'll get all sorts of double NAT errors. That's one reason why we want to set bridged here for uh, this mode. If you're doing forensics and you're setting up a Kali, I just thought I would uh, share this with you. You can click the advanced and then change promiscuous mode to allow or allow all. In general, it's considered good practice or best practice and being a good digital citizen not to leave your network interfaces in promiscuous mode. Other people on your network are not going to appreciate it if your system is sniffing their packets. So anyway, that's just a, it's a nice little um, side note there. Any questions about the network settings for Bridged? Nope. You'll notice that I have my adapter type set to Intel uh, Pro Desktop. That's going to pull to the wireless. So the back end of this is the wireless adapter, right? My wireless adapter on the host is going to create a virtual network card that uses a cable, like a physical Ethernet card. If I go to storage, I want to include something in there, and I'm going to mount I'm going to insert the install media just as if it were a physical disk. So I'm going to, I'm going to choose a disk file. I'm going to go to my downloads. I'm going to select my server 2019 media. Any questions about pointing my empty DVD drive to the DVD media, the digital media, before I begin? Any questions? Nope. Uh, not okay. at the moment. All right, so we're going to click OK. And now we should be ready to go. Uh, it's also good after you finish making changes like that just to click settings one more time. So you want to click settings one more time and look down here to see if there's any exclamation points. If, if I did anything wrong or inconsistent with the hardware, the physical hardware, if there's a compatibility issue with the physical hardware, I would see a yellow exclamation point or a red X down in this area. So I'm, I'm ready to start this. And as I start it, it's going to open a window and it's going to bark about my keyboard and mouse. And it's going to ask me if I want to select a startup disk and I'm going to say start. And here's the auto capture keyboard notification. I like to close these. These are just notices. And you'll see that uh, the image file I could burn to a physical plastic DVD disk is loading digitally. And it's giving me a startup screen for the installation on my system. While I'm waiting for this to start, I'm going to go ahead and open. You'll notice here I'm getting critical on my disk space, but I've I've optimized my personal technology so the amount of remaining disk space isn't as critical. I have a custom uh, virtual memory swap file, so I'll never run out of virtual memory. 
it's not likely that my system would uh, freeze up and and crash even if I run out of space. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead into my uh, into my solution folder and I'm going to open up my license keys and I'm going to be using the standard key for this installation for the local SAM installation. I'm going to want that handy and I want to be able to view it as I'm looking at the other screen. One nice thing about the virtual box manager is that once your virtual machine is running, you don't have to have this. So if you're dealing with a laptop that has limited RAM and disk space, you can close this. You'll actually get better performance while this is, um, while this is operating. So what we're going to do here is situate our windows so that I can reference my key as I get started. This is the opening screen to Windows setup. Once again, I'm going to clear the notice just so it gets out of my way. And I'm going to click Next. And I'm going to click Install Now. In most cases, you're going to click defaults. And much of this process is automagic until you get to the point where you're ready to install a role. And that's very quick and simple inside the, uh, so here's the activate Windows option. And uh, if you'll watch with me, I want to make sure I type this in correctly. If I make a mistake, it's not going to go well. So I'm going to go ahead and try to uh, use See, that's uh, 7F42N. If you just keep typing, you don't have to put in the dashes. It'll put in the dashes automatically. 4JMTV, uh, R4HFB. Uh, Sometimes people type in Bs instead of 8s, and they get the wrong wrong code and they get an error message, make sure you take a closer look at B's and 8's. Those can be uh, different. I have PH4MV and B7XQ3. So I'm just going to verify this real quick. Uh, B7XQ3, PH4MV, R4HFB, 4J MTV, 7F42. Okay, so I'm going to click Next. If you don't have it accessible, you can do this at another time. Um, it's probably going to say that it can't activate the Windows, even though it has the key. Once you connect to the network uh, using the bridged adapter, it'll, it'll, um, it'll authenticate that key. I'm going to click Next. If you run into an error, you can just click, I don't have a product key. Because I use the standard key with that installation media, it's giving me a choice between standard desktop experience and standard uh, server installation, what used to be known as core installation. In server 2016, this was called server 2016 core installation. Character only, no GUI. You want the one with the GUI, we want the desktop experience. If I had put in the data center key, I'd be getting data center options here. Any questions before we continue? No, got it. Okay. It's going to ask you to accept the license terms. That means you're not going to give it away to your friends and family. I'm going to choose custom installation. You'll notice that there's unallocated drive space, 44 gigs large. That's what I want to use. I could format this and choose uh, I could make a new uh, a new hard disk, a logical disk by formatting it, and I could choose different format disk sector sizes called allocation units in Windows, called inodes on a Mac or in a Linux in environment. I'm just going to go ahead and accept this and say next. It's going to use the default size, which is 4K for a disk format, and it's going to format this virtual disk as if it were a physical hard drive, and then load the Windows files in here. This should happen fairly quickly because we have two CPU cores and six gigs of RAM on a solid state hard disk on a host that's been optimized. Um, I'm guessing two or three minutes flat, we should be done. 
going to pause the recording for a moment while this is running. Are there any questions? One of the things that you can confirm and validate while you're waiting on this to run is what you're going to use for a static IP address for your server as it's running. You can also decide on what name your server is going to use as a host. Uh, it's not going to be local SAM. That's just the name of the virtual machine profile within the virtual box management um, application. So that's uh, one of the easiest ways to do this on the local level is to go ahead and see what your uh, see what your local IP address range is and then pick an IP address outside that range. You check on your wireless um, router and see how many addresses are available for dynamic assignment and you want to pick an address that's outside that so that you have a constant address. Your virtual machine will still be able to communicate with the outside world as you'll see in a second. So I'm going to demonstrate this. I'm going to go ahead in here and I'm going to look up my wireless properties to see what kind of address I have. It's using a 192.168.50.32. It's likely that the wireless access router that's being used here at my location is issuing between 30 and 50 IP addresses. I'm going to choose 192.168.50.101. For an IP address, a statically assigned IP address. I'm also going to use the same DNS servers. I'm going to put that in the network configuration of the machine, although it will not surprise me to see that uh, it could have a 33 address that's automatically assigned since my network card is in bridged mode. It'll pick up a dynamic assignment at first. Any questions about choosing a static network address for your server? And a name, choosing a name. Um, no, so just to verify, the, the settings were not done in the system settings on the computer, but in the virtual box network settings. Yes, this is on the host machine. So what you're looking at here is the network assignment that my laptop has received from the local wireless router. Because we set a bridged uh, configuration on the network interface for the virtual machine, it's going to pick up a dynamically assigned one. But before I install a role, I'm going to change the name and I'm going to make sure I have a static address in there. You don't want the network address changing and you don't want the name changing. So if I'm going to put it in a work group, I don't want to use the default work group. I don't want to use some weird name. You'll see in a minute, uh, there'll be a random name assigned like, you know, uh, WXCH-4736. I mean, it sounds like a football game and somebody's about to yell hike. So uh, Windows is going to start, it's going to restart. And one of the fun things about this is you, you have uh, disk media loaded. So you're going to have to refrain from the urge to uh, hit a key because it's going to first access the media to start. Sometimes it first accesses the media to start the installation all over again, depending on your machine. Um, you're, if that happens, you, you don't want to hit any key to load the disk media again. Uh, I don't see a prompt in this case, which means that uh, the install algorithm is smart enough. I'm going to go ahead and clear this nuisance issue again. 
We'll make uh, quick work of remaining changes in the next two minutes and then we'll be done. It's common, oh, well, here's our, it's common for a reboot to occur. And then here's that nasty prompt again. You don't hit a key, you don't click in there. You just let it run. Now it's loading from the hard disk. This is really important. It's very, very important that you keep a record of the first username. And the first username that's gonna be created as administrator, we're going to show you how to change that for security purposes. But I'm gonna put in something that's unique for uh, an administrative password uh, just to get started. And I'm gonna make sure I can't forget that. Something very random and uh, something that's complex. Oh, and of course they have to match. So let's do that again. At this point, we're gonna we're going to um, stop our video and there are some steps that we'll follow once we're inside here to configure the roles, the names, the physical static IP addresses. Um, we'll cover that in a separate video and post that.